the reason I wrote the fired leader, by the way, was because of three data points. The first is that I've been the expensive, highly paid consultant that puts those things together on, sh on the wall. Then I saw the way that the leader, um, they have books, the, the leader book bookshelf, right? Second data point. And then the third data point was how those leaders actually led. And I found a complete incongruence between all those three data points. Welcome back everyone to the Geeks, Geezers and Googleization show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization, a show from the People Forward Network. I'm Ira Wolf, and thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We're the voice of the most important and crucial conversations that are confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the impact and the convergence of business, technology, and people. Googleization Nation, I haven't seen this much controversy in the workplace since the millennials arrived in the late 1990s, and they were blamed for anything and everything, from bad work ethic to the impact of climate change to even hearing about 9-11. Uh, you name it, if you had to point a finger, you can point it at millennials. Well, now those millennials are in their late 30s and mid 40s, and it seems employers and managers need someone new to gaslight. So unless you've been living off the grid for the last two months or so, you're likely well acquainted by now with what is called quiet quitting. While we won't be focused specifically on that, we have the perfect guest today to talk about how leaders should be responding to it. So we're excited today to welcome Paul McCarthy to the show. Paul is on a mission to change the future of leadership, and he's willing to do what few people will, openly accept that our current approach to leadership has failed. Paul does more than walk the talk. He says he's been fired from four executive roles over his 25-year career, and he's proud of it for doing what he was hired to do and for calling out leaders about a broken leadership system. So this is gonna be a great conversation. Paul McCarthy is the author of a new book awaiting to be published, The Fired Leader, F-I-R-E-D, Reinventing the Future of Leadership. And if you are ready to have a really honest, candid, crucial, critical conversation about the future of leadership, you're in the right place today. But before we get there, Jason, it's time for what is one of my favorite segments, Perfect Labor Storm. On each GGG episode, we turn our focus to just one disruptive, surprising, or worrisome trend that we believe you should know. Here's today's latest Perfect Labor Storm trend. 62% of respondents to a recent survey by McKinsey and Company, the global consulting firm, indicate they are seeking even more purpose from their work, 62%. 70% of employees feel that their sense of purpose in life is defined by their work. Employees are generally looking for a more enriching, purposeful experience. So that's for employers who are looking how to stem the quiet quitting or the turnovers or the terminations or the lack of engagement. Uh, you need to pay attention. And here's what's really interesting. The purpose-driven companies tend to experience 40% higher levels of workforce retention than other organizations, and that's according to Deloitte's new Global Marketing Trends Report. So Jason, it sure seems that many organizations need to reinvent their approach, their approach to leadership. Absolutely, and we kind of get a double shot of this today, right, Ira, because we just did an episode earlier today with Dick Bove, Matthew Van Alstein, and John Aiden Byrne talking about we need better leaders more than ever right now because everything is changing everywhere all at once, kind of like the name of the movie that just came out. And so before we bring Paul on to talk about this today, let's do a quick thought experiment. What price or value would you place on one third of your life? Everyone just go ahead and answer that question in your own head really quickly. What price or value would you place on one third of your life? Next, ask yourself, where did that perceived value come from? 
Is that what you truly think a third of your life is worth? Or is it based on a value someone else has placed on it for you? Here's where I'm going with this thought experiment. The hard truth is a lot of folks give up a third of their lives for work. And many times that also means that someone else is determining that monetary value for them. And it's done all in the hopes that when they turn 65 one day, that they can magically kiss that part of their life goodbye, which they didn't really enjoy anyway. And then they hope that it made them enough money to enjoy their final 12 years on earth based on the average American lifespan. So I know some of you may be thinking, Jason, that's too harsh of a critique on what work and leadership has become for so many people. But Ira, the perfect labor storm data that you just shared suggests that now is the perfect wake up call and that people are answering that call and they're thinking more deeply about their work. They're thinking about the leaders that they're choosing and wanting to follow and how it should contribute to a happier and more fulfilled life. And so I can't think of a better guest to, for us to have today than Paul McCarthy to talk about failed leadership and how we get this turned around. Jason, I mean, that's, you know, we talk about this all the time and we were in, in a bit of a conversation the other day in a kerfuffle with uh, another thought leaders uh, about how leadership, how employers need to change. And, you know, we certainly believe it's, a, it's, a, it's an employee centric, a people first type of a world we're moving to. Uh, not everyone agrees with that. Everybody has good reasons to believe that. Um, but apparently it's not working. I mean, we still have high turnover. People, companies are still struggling with bringing on new people, attracting new people, keeping new people. Um, you know, pe in general, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be worse off tomorrow than I was today. Uh, and yet there, there's a lot of people that feel that way because they don't have a purpose. They aren't, they aren't driven. The companies aren't creating a, uh, an environment. And we've heard this from Dick Bovey this morning and Matt Van Alstein. Um, it was also from Matt Sigelman. He just had a, a big opinion piece about this from Burning Glass Institute that the number one way out of all this, out of all this mess for employers is training and helping people. And it's reskilling and upskilling, but we need to create a better environment. And there's a lot of people saying, I'm not sure I would do what if I don't do what I was doing. And they're going to have to do something different. So what an opportunity there. Uh, and especially today with Paul, Paul McCarthy coming on and talking about a fresh, a new approach. I can't say a fresh approach. It, it's got to be a fresh approach, but a different approach. Uh, to leadership. And um, he's, he's certainly going to challenge a lot of the, the norms and traditions that we've had. Before we get there, just want to remind uh, all our listeners uh, that you can't earn SHRM credits for listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Uh, you can earn between a half and a full credit. All you need to do is go up to googleizationnation.com, click on podcast, download the form. There's a very short form just to verify you uh, were listening to the report and uh, we'll send you in return an activity code and you can earn some credits. And you, if not only today's, but you can go back through 220 episodes uh, and get credits. So you can you you can take care of a lot of, of your uh, needs there. I mentioned Googleization Nation. If you haven't subscribed, uh, please do. You'll get periodic emails about updates and uh, we got a lot of new activities coming out in the fall. So you wanna be part of that for sure. And then finally, uh, please, uh, if you're listening to this on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, uh, or YouTube or LinkedIn, please leave a comment if you like it. Please review, uh, please rate the show. Uh, leave a little bit of a review for us. Um, spread the word. Uh, we're now in the top one and a half percent, which was our end of the year goal. And uh, we're hopefully we'll be in the top one percent or even top half a percent uh, by the end of the year. Thanks to everybody, uh, uh, that all the listeners, all of, all of Googleization Nation. Absolutely. And so now it seems like a great time to go ahead and bring our special guest today, Paul McCarthy, into the studio and get this party started. And there's Paul. Welcome, Paul. Hello, gents. I've been uh, eagerly listening backstage, chomping at the bit just to kind of uh, start this conversation. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll let you take it where you want it. Where do you want to start, Paul? Uh, well, I mean, so many nuggets. Where, did, where, where do I start? Um, you know, I'd like to say that the um, um, that we can hide this monster under the stairs, but we can't. So the genie is out of the bottle. 
and so there's no turning back. So, you know, Ira, I'm looking at your background and, you, you know, words like alignment, reskilling, um, culture, never normal, but readiness. All of these words are resonating with me beyond belief at the moment because we're not ready and we're not ready for what's coming. Um, COVID was just one example of a, of a global human capital disruption and there are more on the way. So, uh, I mean, I some of the stats that you talked about, I mean, let, let, let's just talk about this whole concept of quiet quitting as you as you started kind of going down there. I'm, I feel like a broken record internally because every time I read something about quiet quitting or another viral TikTok video or someone jumping on the bandwagon about what this is, et cetera, et cetera, I start to quietly infuriate. And the reason I quietly infuriate is because in my research globally, as well as leveraging other scholars and work out there about dysfunction and toxicity and disengagement, quiet quitting is another name for that concept, except it's the manifestation of people starting to put their foot in the ground at a line in the sand and say, enough, enough already. So here's, here's the challenge I have to everybody that talks about quiet quitting. Stop talking about quiet quitting. You heard me. Stop talking about it and do something with the deeper issues that it's representing. Right. So you talked about, you know, 62 percent of people that McKinsey surveyed are looking for purpose right, in, in their work. I'm hate, I hate to break it to us. That's nothing new. One in four HBR studied three or four years ago, pre-COVID, were looking for new jobs. And guess why they were new, looking for new jobs? because their purpose didn't align with the organization's purpose. Let's stop rehashing statistics and actually create the environment to have the conversation about these things. So that IRA, those things on the wall behind you, they become part of our vernacular. They become part of how we, we approach the future. So I, I'm really interested in kind of, you know, at the back, the backdrop of my work is about creating the conditions to have honest and forward moving conversations. That's that's really what I'm driven by, and so I would I would really welcome this opportunity to kind of pause and get some reflections from you guys on this new phenomenon of quiet quitting and what to you that it represents. I'm not trying to turn the interview around here, but I'm, I'm curious. Like everybody's going after this concept, and long after all of the shiny objects, have, you know, people have stopped and they've got bored because the vanity metrics have dried up. I'll still be here moving my agenda forward which is to reframe the narrative about the future of leadership and address deep systemic institutional dysfunction and toxicity. So what a way to open up this conversation. Right. I love it. And quite quitting. So for me, I'm, I'm a, a millennial, I'm an older millennial. And so for me, I had never heard of the term quiet quitting until it became viral here recently, Paul, but my, my co-host Ira enlightened me and let me know that quiet quitting has been around for quite a while. It maybe has been called different things. And I guess a question in my head is, is it really any different from the engagement numbers we get from Gallup every year? Uh, since they've been measuring employee engagement for 30 plus years, it's roughly a third of people are excelling at doing their job and they feel good about it. And two thirds of people don't um, or won't. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, disengagement, We, as we're going down and creeping into that path, Gallup's infamous study now which is i think it's almost 8.7 trillion dollars every year on global disengagement that's what it costs our economy that's more than the gdp gdp of some countries but here's the other thing that number is rising every year because guess what when i started doing the work i'm doing which was about four years ago that number was about seven trillion if i'm not mistaken that's a pretty big shift in less than four years. Mm -hmm. And it's only getting, getting, it's going up, it's going up. And, and so what I'm really interested in doing is, you know, we've, we've heard this kind of this, this example about the matrix and the, you know, blue pill, red pill. And part of my work is about helping people to figure out if they want to wake up to the, the reality of what it's like to be in a disengaged workforce. And if they don't, then they don't have to. They can take the other pill and they'll forget all about me. But what I'm trying to do is create those conditions so that we can start to become aware. Then we wake up 
then we think about, well, we're seeing all this stuff. Do we have the courage to address it? How do we evolve our thinking? And then how do we embody the change that we want to make? And everybody is at a different point in their, their journey here. And I, you know, you'll come on to learn about my story, I'm sure. I didn't want to be doing what I'm doing. Like, I wanted to be the leader who fitted in. I had the corner office. I had the status. I had the title. I had the direct reports. I had the PL. But I just couldn't fit in. I couldn't stand by and watch the dysfunction and the hypocrisy and the the disengagement right before my very eyes in those lovely gray cubicles that we we're all used to before COVID, where people would, were doing the bare minimum, but they weren't saying anything because they didn't want to get fired. And guess what happened to me? I spoke out about the system's dysfunction and I got fired four times. And so, Paul, what, I guess this kind of ties into this. Why do we still have so many leaders that are clamoring for the way things used to be? Yeah, interesting. Very interesting because there's two ways of looking at this. Um, we cited or you cited the McKinsey research earlier on in your in your kind of opening. Part of McKinsey's research also looked at um, this co this rising concept of uncaring leadership. And they they suggested that 86 percent of um, leaders where, where employees gave feedback about why they left um, the organization was because the leaders were uncaring. Now, I put a post out about this um, a few months ago. It got about 20,000 views and a lot of comments and reshares, which was great because again, we started this idea of, of what I'm doing in the practice and fire leadership, literally from a basement with no windows, playing ping pong, eating pizza, determining whether or not the current leadership model was broken or not. So now almost 900,000 people have some awareness of what we're doing. And that post I put out was really interesting because I put a different perspective forward, which was those uncaring leaders that you left the organization because of, they're also human. And they, they may believe that they have to be complicit and complacent in the system. They feel that they have to fit in. Right. So it's another example for me and my research and the team that, that we're pulling together around this that shows even those leaders that seem like they're part of the problem. Some are, obviously, but the majority of them feel that they have to play a part in the system. Right. So you, I think, Jason, mentioned uh, when, when in the preamble about waking up and people have a choice. Right. In my book, the D trait of the fire. Uh, methodology, the fire leadership methodology is direct and transparent. So every day you wake up, you have an opportunity to look in the mirror, like when you brush your teeth and ask yourself, am I going to play the political game today or not? And your whole experience will be determined by the answer to that question. So a lot of these leaders that McKinsey found to be in uncaring, I believe are playing a part in the system. And that's the, that's the way that they're getting by. So again, if I give them the blue pill, do they want now to be aware of this, to do something about it or not? Everybody has the choice. And so I think that's a big reason why people stay in, in, in a broken system because we've all got bills to pay. We've all got mortgages to pay, rents to pay. And, and there are also some of us that are fearful of, of leaving a job or being fired. And we go to the bookshelf to look out for the self-development book on how to cope with being fired. And then we massage our resume. Everyone does it. Um, I didn't. I, I thought, you know what? This is a great experience. And what it uncovered for me was so many more nuggets that real I would realize, oops, connecting the dots. The system is kind of failing us. So I, I meet everybody where they are. I appreciate where they are. And, and the situations for everybody is different, right? So we have to understand that when we look at why people still remain in a broken system. And, and I have a lot more empathy for that these days, whereas four years ago, I quite literally wanted to throw the grenade in the room and blow, up, blow it up. But now I meet everybody where they are because I'm compassionately empathetic. Hey, Paul, you, you tied in a few things. There's a lot to unpack with What's what it? you said there for sure. Uh, but you started to make me think that 
when when you ask the question about the quiet quitting and we're going to stop talking about it, do something differently, you know, certainly it means a lot of things to a, a number of different people. Uh, yesterday, the week's running together, but uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, I put out a query to anybody and it was about, do they think, um, is there a relationship between fixed and growth mindset and quiet quitting? And I, I bet you I have a hundred responses in, right. in my inbox. I haven't even get to them. Now, some of them have viewed quiet quitting in a really negative way. It's that people quit and they're low work ethic and so forth. And then other people, which is my belief, uh, really all it is in, in, the, in the simplest term is people set boundaries that they're, they're not going to live to work. Uh, they're not going to do as Jason described, and that's my baby boomer generation. Uh, you climbed that vertical ladder. You just climbed and climbed and climbed. You had to play the game. That was it. Uh, in order to get that promotion to rise up. Uh, or you could be in a frontline job and just do your job, follow the lead, don't speak up, just show up every day. Uh, and you can, you can have a 30 or 40 career. And both those things are gone. There are no more 30 or 40 year mm -hmm. careers. Uh, and playing the game, um, you know, certainly people are going to challenge it, but it's probably not going to be in the same organization. It may not even be in the same industry. There's going to be a lot of movement around. But it's the hypocrisy from leadership, which is what you're talking about, that for years we heard people are our most important asset, number one. We still hear that. The second is for the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years, we've heard more and more about we want our people to have work-life balance. And then the third is, and, and this maybe it wasn't the third, but the solution to that was we're going to have a wellness program which are notoriously failing and most people don't participate or it's only for the people that are, are, are really, um, you know, have, have a, are willing to admit they have, that they're burnt out and stressed out and have a mental illness. And then there's a whole stigma around that. And Jason talks about that all the time. So we have companies that are saying, leaders that are saying, people are most important asset. We're going to help you. We're concerned about work-life balance. And then all of a sudden, Quiet quitting hits, and all it is is about setting boundaries. I'm willing to give you 150% of the time that you pay me for. You hired me for a 40 hour a week job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you 100% or more during that time. But no, I'm not going on vacation and checking in every day. No, I'm not, I'm not spending long hours. No, I'm not going to make up because you put a hiring freeze on, and now I have to do the job of two or three people. No, I'm not doing that. You paid our original employment contract was 40 hours for this amount of money. Yeah, again, so much in there. Um, and, and I'd like I'd, I'd like to say that I'm not I'm not trampling on the idea of quiet quitting. I think it's important to, to raise this concept. But I, I do think it's it's the outpouring and the manifestation of people saying enough with this dysfunctional hypocritical system. I think it's doing a great job in that way, but it doesn't go far enough. Like there was some, I think Joseph Folkman from HBR um, put an article out the other day about some some ways to address quiet quitting. I, I know I know him and his work and, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the work he does in resilience, but it didn't go far enough. It didn't actually give practical tips like it suggested. It just, it was very navel gazing, pontificating, which, what I'm finding is is there's a lot of within the scholars that that we the three of us probably roam around with, a lot of them are focused on propagating ideas and academic ideas that that are quite theory based. Whereas a lot of my work and a lot of the, the, the why I'm critical of a lot of others in my my space now is because they're part of the problem, right? They're not providing solutions. So if I just bring into the picture. I think it's almost 366 billion is spent on developing leaders, right? Every year, that number is also growing. And 14% of people who procure that leadership development thinks that it works, right? So a lot of the people that we know are propagating our next fancy programs, keynotes, trainings, whatever they are, but they're not going far enough. Right? And I believe that we need to address that as well. But just, just on something that you said about um, quiet quitting, I want to pick up on. Um, the reality of corporate culture is very different, right, than what, so setting boundaries is one thing. Okay, going on holiday, I'm not going to check my email is another thing. Let me just tell you live on air, I won't name the firm, but um, 
when I was in a, a big consulting firm, right, that have billboards plastered over everywhere, um, we had this thing called the Working Time Directive in the UK at the time. And I was told categorically, uh, which the Working Time Directive, for those who know, would limit your um, hours that you worked to, to 40 or 45 a week, right? I was told categorically off the record that if I didn't opt out of the working time directive, that my time at that consulting firm would be limited, that I would be on the bench, that I wouldn't get the kinds of gigs that, that I wanted to, to do to pursue my career. That was in early 2000s, right? So the corporate culture reality is quite different. So uh, as much as I applaud quiet quitting and, and the kind of setting of boundaries at the superficial level, it's only treating the wound. It's a band-aid on a bigger problem. And until we create the environment to have the conversations about the hypocrisy in the corridors of power amongst C-suite boards, directors, VPs, and actually get them saying, look, let's have honest conversations, which means, by the way, we have to, to use, you know, those buzzwords that, that we, we all put on the mission statements on the wall. Let's be transparent, transparency, integrity, open door policy, right? The reason I wrote The Fired Leader, by the way, was because of three data points. The first is that I've been the expensive, highly paid consultant that puts those things together on, a sh on the wall. Then I saw the way that the leader, um, they have books, the, the leader book bookshelf, right? Second data point. And then the third data point was how those leaders actually led. And I found a complete incongruence between all those three data points. Right? So why have Jim Collins good to great on your bookshelf and say you have an open door policy if it takes two weeks to schedule a meeting with you, but before I have that meeting with you, I have to have a meeting before the meeting and then a post meeting after the meeting. That, Ira, is the hypocrisy. And that's what I would step on. I would later call it the ego-based leadership landmines in pursuit of creating the practice that's reinventing the future of leadership. So I, I kind of, I, I think we need almost a, um, a reality check with, okay, let's create and set boundaries with this new phenomenon, all right? Quiet quitting. But we can only do that if we're, if we're going to address the elephant in the room, which is the deeper conversation. And and I, I've i got this tool that I created as part of one of the areas that I'm focusing on. And it's quite simply name what you see, all right? So get a leadership team together and get them talking about the challenges that they see, the toxicity that they see in and amongst them as a team. I'm trialing this out with three clients that I've got at the moment. And then you get them to create a scorecard and prioritize what is the most toxic thing in that team that they need to address. Then they work on it over the next couple of weeks. They, they reconvene and they look at where the data has shifted, right? I foresee a world where Glassdoor has a toxicity barometer on it, right? People say it's crazy, that it'll never work. They, they kind of said that about the work I'm doing four years ago. Look where it is now. I think with the shift that's happening, we cannot ignore this any longer, guys. We, we cannot, we have to We have to get more practical, we have to get in the trenches, we have to have those uncomfortable conversations. Hey, Paul, you just set a, a record, a geek skeezers and Googleization record for the fastest conversation we've had. Uh, and I'm not talking about speed, but it just, time just flew by. I, I, I looked down and go, whoa, we're at the bottom of the hour already. Uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, so we are going to be back and we definitely want to address what fired means. You have the five traits. We want to sure. address that and then find out some tips that companies can do so we don't feed into this toxicity of just theory and talking about it. But we're going to take a short break. Uh, you've been listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We're here with Paul McCarthy, uh, the author of a new book, The Fired Leader, an executive who's been fired four times and proud of it. For, for doing what he needed to do. Uh, we will, uh, we're gonna hear from our sponsor, gonna hear a little bit about adaptability, and we will be back in one minute. Stay tuned. For most of us, change is freaking terrifying. And unfortunately, there's no app to adapt. That might change in the not so distant future, but for now, we're on our own. That means we can either accept our default future or reimagine our tomorrow. For those of you who choose default, good luck. Just remember, there's no pause button for change. You can't turn back the clock. And there's no get out of jail free card in this age of perpetual uncertainty. Like it or not, 
change will happen all around us. And that change is not becoming just more disruptive and frequent, but volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, or VUCA. Fortunately, you can make change work for you and turn it into your personal and competitive advantage. Reimagine your future to one in which you're living with purpose, you're happy, and you're growing, thriving, and flourishing. If you're ready to rewrite your next life chapter and regain control of your destiny in this never normal world, your journey starts here. Contact the leader in adaptability and making change work for you, your team, and your organization. Ira S. Wolf, adaptability.expert. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the to our Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. We're talking about uh, the future of leadership uh, from Paul McCarthy, the author of The Fired Leader. Uh, we're talking about a lot of the challenges, uh, the toxicity. I love uh, what you said earlier, Paul, that Glassdoor is going to have a toxicity rating. I think that it's probably there already uh, in all the comments and the stars. It just doesn't blatantly say this is a toxic culture. Um, but you you have an, I mean, your acronym, we talk about FIRED, and, and I guess people are well familiar with that from The Apprentice and our former president. Uh, you're FIRED, but you're FIRED means something a little bit different and uh, represents something. So let's, before we get too far into this and the remaining part of the show, let's talk about that and then move into some tips that people can can actually do to to change this and as an appropriate response uh, to things like quiet quitting. Mm. Um, and just before we, we go on to that, um, I also wrote an article recently that was um, leveraging MIT Sloan's data that they had collated over a number of years from what they're calling kind of um, a precursor to toxicity. So they were using stats from Glassdoor and and again, that, that was on HBR, and, and I put an article out about that. Great start, doesn't go far enough, and I've reached out to the authors to talk to them more about that. But you're right, all the data is there. The analytics needs to be done on it, but um, it needs to go further. Um, so, you know, you, you guys talked at the top of the, the conversation about, you know, that, that you need better leaders, that we need, we need better leaders in place because of this, you know, the approach isn't working now. And so fired leadership was born, well, quite frankly, fired leadership was born because I kept getting fired for having the leadership qualities that I was hired for. And so I got curious about that because on the one hand, I was being recruited to have these qualities. And when I displayed them, I, I stepped on what I would later call ego-based leadership landmines. I would get my wrists slapped. And eventually I would be fired for demonstrating what I was asked to, to, to de uh, demonstrate. But as an expert in leadership development, so my job is to design, develop and deliver leadership programs to household name clients. I started to get really curious about whether these five qualities featured in programs that I developed as well as around the world leading programs. And they didn't, right? So I started to then form this hypothesis are we firing leaders who have the leadership qualities that we will need to navigate ongoing disruption? And this was four years ago, right? So this was pre-COVID, pre this largest global human capital experiment that we had. And so I set to work on just doing some research out of plain curiosity on whether this hypothesis was accurate or not. And then it led into a a conversation that that grew and grew and it became a book and all of a sudden this book had a methodology a coaching framework a, a set of training tools now a set of programs that i talk around and and it and it, so i'm just explaining the background because it wasn't me trying to come up with a gimmicky name for something um that you know and then add to the the, the growing pile of in effective leadership development programs or tools. In fact, if anything, it's an anti-leadership approach. And, and so, so a lot of complexity is out there around leadership models, competency models, tools, everything. And I, I boiled it down to five simple qualities that 
I then started to to research more and more, and I would then be introduced to scholars in in the fields of curiosity and authenticity, transparency, and I, and I grew my network that way. But essentially, the FIRE framework is is a kind of you know one <laughs> someone who's re, uh, reviewed my book and endorsed it has almost said it's like a post-it note guide to the future of leadership, right? Uh, because it's quite simple and it sounds quite simple. But it has a lot of depth and substance behind it. And so the academics, of course, will, will say, oh, it hasn't been peer reviewed and put through 5,000 laboratory experiments, but never actually applied to, to real leaders. That's fine. Stay in the academic circles because I'm more practical and tangible. Um, and of course, there are people that are starting to emulate and leverage what this is, which is great because it's growing a movement. But essentially, the FIRE framework is fresh thinking inquisitive nature, real and accountable, expressive and challenging and direct and transparent. So if you want, I can kind of literally go through a couple of like for each one and just kind of give you an idea because they're on the website um, that we have as well. But fresh thinking for me is, is, is the precursor for innovation, right? You can't be innovative without being disruptive. And you can't be disruptive without having the ability to think and dare to think and act differently. But what that relies on is creating the conditions and the culture for that. So fresh thinking is all about thinking differently. Think of that really, really annoying mosquito that keeps hitting you and biting you. Um, that's how a fresh thinker appears in an organization where, where they're in a meeting and they're saying, yeah, but what about if we tried this? And then someone says, because they're, they're all group think orientated, the leaders, leadership team, C-suite will say, that'll never work. We tried that. The consultants did that. Uh, you're both smiling because you know what I'm talking about, right? So it's, it's injecting new ideas, right? And it doesn't care about rank, rank, stature, the game. All it does is introduce a new idea. And, and fired leaders, by the way, we're not talking about leaders that get fired for stealing out the cookie jar, for stealing post-it notes. We're talking about leaders that bring new ideas so that the fresh thinker is, is the leader who, who doesn't see any boundaries and is actually, you talked about purpose earlier, they join and stay in your organization because they are purpose focused and everything they do is about contributing to the purpose with these new ideas. It's not about getting promoted. The I, the inquisitive nature, that, that kind of builds on some of Francesca Gino's work where she wrote the, curios the business case for curiosity at H uh, Harvard. Um, she's written a, a, a brilliant book called Rebel Talent as well. And she starts to talk about introducing disruptive and rebellious qualities for leaders. But that's underpinned by this insatiable drive for curiosity. So inquisitive nature is, is used interchangeably with curiosity. But it's again, it, it, it comes out in an organization where when the leader is always asking why. Right. Why? Why do we do this? Why? Like, like a five year old going back in time. And, and, it, and it's because we want to get to the bottom of things. And, and interestingly, research came out and said that I think it was over 700 um, chief learning officers actually discourage leaders from having curiosity because it costs too much, it takes too much time and might risk failure. And so now I'm thinking to myself, there's like quiet quitting, there's a, there's a, a swath of um, articles and makeshift thought leaders writing about curiosity, right? Um, some great material coming out there. But again, lots of people jumping on a bandwagon when they don't have the depth and substance to really know what this means. But but that's how that, that quality shows up in your leaders now. Um, real and accountable. Everybody talks about, remember on, on the mission statements, vulnerable, authentic, et cetera, et cetera. But this is being real. This is showing up, not wearing a mask. And I don't mean a COVID mask. I mean, most leaders, and employees turn up to an organization believing they have to play the game. They don't show their true selves at work, so they hide themselves. This is about showing up warts and all. And I'm not talking about bring your dog to work and hope people stroke your dog and it's did you step too far over and being vulnerable direction. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about owning your mistakes and basically um, never throwing people under the bus, right? And always talking truth to power. Don't say something just because you you know your promotion depends on it. You know, I went I worked in some consultant firms where I had to go to the obligatory summer 
summer ball, which was at the partner's house. And the amount of people that laughed at the unfunny jokes was beyond me because it, it they did it because they wanted to be promoted. You're not being real. You're not being genuine. But you say you are with, with the statements on the wall. Another example is hypocrisy. And the accountable part of being real is being accountable to being real. Right. So it's not it's not the, the way that the word accountability is used often these days, which is, you know, got to be account accountable for your metrics and delivering this, this. No, it's just being accountable for being you. Right. The E, the expressive and challenging. You know, you know, when you join a leadership team and you're the newbie on the block and uh, and but this isn't just my experience. This is, is hundreds of other leaders that have actually reached out to me to tell me their story, which actually is going into book number two. Go get book first, book one published first. But the number of leaders in a leadership team that inherit or, or or get into this concept of groupthink. Leaders all think the same way in this team. So you're a new leader, situate yourself in this, this scenario. You're a new leader, you, you're joining a meeting to talk about a subject. Everybody's zigging and you're zagging. You bring a new idea out and they all shoot you down. The expressive and the challenging is having the courage to be able to stand your ground with the new idea. Remember, because you're purpose driven, you're thinking about what's best for the organization. You're not thinking about what's best for the, the silo based behaviors and the politics and the promotioning and the pol politicking. And so you have to have the courage internally to be able to express that. And, and you have to be able to challenge the status quo. So th this again is, is the leader that, that say, why, why do we do this way? Does it work? Well, we've always done it that way. Well, does it mean it works? What do we need to do differently? And then the D is the direct and transparent. And that I referred earlier when I said, you wake up in the morning, you have a choice. You have a choice on whether you decide to play the game or not. Most of us remember the 86% uncaring leaders. That's why employees leave, according to McKinsey. Arguably, they, they are playing the game, but they have a choice. So the direct and the transparent is about saying, I'm not playing a political game. And I'm not here to play a political game. So that manifests quite easily as the meeting before the meeting, the meeting after the meeting, and the conversations that you're not invited to. So that in a nutshell, that's the fired framework, Ira um, and Jason. And, and a part of that is is all sorts of things like how do you how do you know if you've got these qualities in your leaders? So the behaviours that they would demonstrate, how would you recruit for them? So a big part of what I do around fire leadership is to shift the narrative that hiring managers, VPs of HR, chief people officers are having about how they identify, recruit, onboard, and develop leaders. We know the system doesn't work. So I'm helping them to understand how they can look for these five qualities in all of those parts of the process. Um, and so it's a ripple effect that I'm creating, which is kind of getting more and more people aware of these qualities, reframing what they mean, because they may not appear in an organization and an approach to leadership now the way they, the, they might be perceived differently. I, like I tried to give some examples and I, I go into a lot more detail in the book and the framework and some of the other work that I've done in, in this area. But essentially, that's the five framework. And, and it builds on the shoulders of giants and it, it critiques what works, what doesn't work. But it offers a counterintuitive approach to actually look for, for future talent. And, and at the heart of it is embracing your troublemakers, embracing your, your disruptors, your rebels. Um, you know, if I can say this word on air, disturbers. Um, it's embracing that talent and not seeing it through the lens that we currently see it through. And that takes a whole narrative shift, a whole paradigm shift. But most importantly, it takes the acknowledgement and the courage to admit that the way we do it now isn't working. I'm going to pause there. And that's a good pause, Paul, because we're, we're, all, we're running out of time. We're coming up to the end. So there's a couple of things that we need to do. But I will tell you that we talk about it as shift disturbers. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> so it's like, don't let the shift hit your plan. So um, but there's, <laughs> it's a lot of sh shift disruption. We'll have to, yeah, <laughs> so we'll be playing off that a lot. Yeah. Uh, Paul, I, I 
I'm going to speak for Jason and, and all of Googleization Nation. We definitely got to have you back and <laughs> dig into each of uh, each of those traits. Uh, there was so much that you unpacked there. Going all the way back to you said that, you know, why you got fired for doing your job. Um, I, I often say that, I was, you know, I talk, uh, uh, wrote the book, uh, a book, Recruiting in the Age of Googleization, talked about what people do wrong in every single job posting as we're looking for a highly motivated, inspirational, innovative people. And the first thing that happens when they get there is that's not the way we do it around here. True. Very true. Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't, it's not just the executive suite. It's all the way down to the frontline, you know, mechanic and production worker. Um, but uh, we have a closing question. I told you this ahead of time. I hope, and you said, ask me challenging questions. So I'm going to ask you, is there anything that we should have asked that we didn't uh, during the conversation? Yeah, I think it's taken for granted now these days with, with the work and where I am, because it's taken three to four years to get to where I'm at. So people have have assumed that, that they know the why. And so... Um, you didn't ask me why am I doing this? Why so, are you doing this, Paul? <laughs> and the reason I think you didn't ask me is because we're so like-minded and and on the page that that we know something has to shift. But but the why for me is, and this might get quite esoteric and emotional, but um, thirty to forty years from now, when whoever is 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 a leader. And might be listening to this or or inherit like become a leader i don't want them to have to go through these issues and address these challenges now maybe i'm utopic and idealistic but i'm doing the work that we have at the practice so that people who will never meet me will benefit from what we're doing here the shifts that we're making right I'm not, of course, I'm a, a capitalist, but I'm a capitalist with conscience, right? So I'm, you know, I want to be a thinker that generates opportunities and programs and speaking and all that, right? That, that, that's a given. Yet in section three of my first book, I give away $3 million of consulting work, a soup to nuts roadmap for people that, you know what, go and take this work and try it in your organization. So I don't want you to even feel you need to approach me like a lot of other people do and funnel them to the, the great websites and products and services that they sell. So I'm, the why for me is really, it, it's a movement so that people that, that never even know me, meet me or interact with me or even heard of me, the way that they lead in the future, it we've had some impact. So we've had some impact in changing the conversation. That That's, that's my ultimate why. I love that, Paul. And I mean, you, we can tell and our listeners can too, that this is something that uh, you just didn't fall into, that this is your your purpose and you're living that out. And we thank you for doing that and for sharing it with our with our guests today. And we will absolutely have to get you on for a round two um, as we head into 2023. That sounds weird to say, but we're on the back half of 2022. Mm. But before we kind of wrap things up, we've got to get to one of our most popular segments called the lightning round. And just like Ira said, before we came on the show today, you said, throw you some hardball questions. So we'll start off with a couple softballs, but then I'm going to throw a couple screwballs your way. Okay. All right. I'm going to see let's, if I can catch start here. All right. How about your favorite musical artist or band? Oh, got to be City in Color. City in Color is a, is a Canadian band. Um, I, I got into them when I moved to Canada uh, in 2011. Hadn't heard of them before, love them. Dallas Green is the lead singer. Um, some amazing lyrics, very, very story specific um, and purposeful, so. I love that. And I, Ira, I can't speak for you, but I haven't heard of that band before. So now I'm gonna hop on Spotify and have to check them out. Great band, great band. Awesome. All right, now you get to choose a superpower. Which superpower are you choosing? Ooh, okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, more empathy, I think. Yeah, more empathy. Because as as uh, as painful as my journey over the last four years has been, it's brought me to the point where I'm I'm really understanding people's pain and, and feeling it compassionately and put it like walking in their shoes. Um, because I I tend to be a big picture thinker innovative disruptive and and i tend to have to slow down i'm like i'm the early adopter in the startup world i'm like you're not here yet right 
and I, I sometimes don't fully understand where people are along their journey. So my superpower would be able to do that. And and I think you know if I, anyone listening to this, I'm sure isn't a former romantic partner of me. But um, if I'd had that superpower when I had had quite a lot of romantic relationships, I think my life might might have. I uh, worked out a little bit differently. <laughs> I like that. Well, when you said that, my mind went to just go with mind manipulation. Then you can uh, take out the whole empathy part and just get people to think the way you do. But that's yeah. probably not a good answer. Probably yeah. not a good answer. Yours was much better. That's another conversation with you, I'm sure. <laughs> right. Absolutely. All right. Just a couple more here. Let's yeah. go all the way back to high school. What's something that your classmates would be surprised to see about you now? They'd be surprised to see me doing this. Because um, when I was in school, I was very studious. I was very quiet. Um, I was very fearful of public speaking. I was very scared of letting my ideas and my voice be known. And I, I always had this kind of uh, rumbling of something that was nourishing, something that was growing, but I didn't know what it was. And it, you know, as a student, I would have been the student that would would have been very quiet and and just kept my head down and moved along. And, and now I've got something to say around this whole piece of work. So my, my, my former high school students, some of which I'm still very much in contact with and are, are friends and follow me on, on my platforms, they're very surprised that, that I would have taken this option. But as I said earlier, guys, I didn't choose this. It chose me. And so, you know, the accidental future of leadership person, that's what I am. Love it. And then we'll let you go on on this one, Paul. But what is one of the biggest lessons that you've ever learned in life? Hmm. Or maybe best words of advice that you've ever been given? Yeah. Um, avoid knee-jerk reactions. Because it could either land you in prison, not that it did with me, uh, or it could land you fired, which it did with me. Uh, or it could lose you friends and, and acquaintances along the way. So that kind of couples back to empathy as well as a superpower. But I think, I think yeah, avoiding knee-jerk reactions so you can get the lay of the land and understand all of the contributing pieces so that you can reflect and, you know, because, again, I'm already three steps ahead. But if I had that ability, I could fill in perhaps some of the data and the, the analysis of that data. Um, to have more robust solutions, perhaps. So that's what I would uh, I would say there. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure from beginning to end. Uh, just <laughs> just a lot of tips, facts, great conversation, easy listening. As I said, I completely lost perspective of time here. Uh, and we definitely want to have you back. You got an invitation to come back. We want to explore that. Uh, we're going to have some continued conversations, I know, uh, of, of a couple events that are coming up. And uh, we're going to do that. Across the screen, we do have uh, one way to reach you is go to paulmacleadership.com. That's your website. Uh, any other ways that people can get in touch with you? Well, I think LinkedIn is, is a clear one that I use. Uh, again, my personal profile, Paul McCarthy, or Twitter uh, under Paul Mac Leadership is a, is a good way to get in touch with me. Um, and so, and, and actually, you know, probably email direct message through LinkedIn is better. Um, I'm, I'm on that tool quite a lot. So anyone wants to reach out and, and dive deeper, then yeah, happy to, happy to chat. And keep an eye on that book, The Fired Leader, probably looking at 2023. Perfect. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing just to kind of um, push push out through this is um, um, I'm doing a future leadership symposium, which I, I would love to talk with you guys about backstage too, but with John Spence and Dr. Abe Kurez, um, that's coming up in November. So I'm going to be putting a post out at, on that soon. But that's also a way people can get get more information about the future of leadership because we'll be creating an environment where we talk about the future of leadership in a way that's very congruent with, with what I've espoused in terms of my principles and philosophies, as well as the panelists. So um, that's another way that, that, that we can talk about this subject in a live capacity. So that's coming out, I think, November the 8th. Well, so. Paul, once again, really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to have you back and we'll continue. And, and I know offline, we'll be continuing the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ira. And uh, it's been, it's just been a, an absolute pleasure to get the opportunity to um, to have these conversations and, and you know, the, the questions asked at the end were really, uh, 
yeah, they made me think. So, so Jason, <laughs> thank you for that. We, we did the challenge, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I was up for the challenge. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. That one did go by fast, Ira. Super fast. In incredible. Both of ours today. Just, uh, uh, again, our conversation with Odin Capital uh, Conversations with Dick Beauvais and Matt Van Alstein and John Aiden Byrne. So hope people will, will catch that. That's the, the previous episode that we've had. Uh, what were a couple of your takeaways? I know uh, I, I have way more than we can mention here. But. Yeah, I jotted down several notes. But for me, these weren't Paul's words, but he was talking about it. the words in psychology is Stockholm Syndrome. And that's where someone who's captive, uh, eventually they develop an affinity for their captor. And I couldn't help but those, those type of words kind of ringing in my head when he was talking about the 86% of people in McKinsey study who were talking about, uh, you know, leaving because of uncaring leadership. Um, but they, many times people will stay because of the fear of the unknown or fear of making a change. Um, that was a big takeaway for me today from what Paul shared. I've got a few. I mean, uh, one is just a, a quirky mention was the uh, toxicity barometer. On, on Glassdoor. And again, I think a lot of people are going to be, well, people are talking about that now. They're just doing it indirectly, but it'll be interesting to see if somebody doesn't pick up on that. I, I think we got a new name for ourselves. We've got Shift Busters. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, as far as who we are and where we're going. But I think this is an important, you know, this was important. I mentioned at the end and, and Paul mentioned it several times. I mean, he got fired for doing what they hired him to do. We hear this so much from, you know, every job posting employees. I mean, people get hired because they're all looking for highly motivated people. They're looking for inspirational, innovative people, people that want to grow. And then the first opportunity they have to do that, they check out. Oh, I think we may have lost Ira. Well, Googleization Nation, we want to thank you uh, for tuning in today. Um, as always, you have helped us get into the top one and a half percent of all podcasts in the world. And we are very much on track to make it all the way to the end of the year, well within the top half percent of all podcasts in the world. So thank you to you. Thank you to um, our uh, our podcast partners at People Forward Network who help us produce and promote the show. And of course, you, the listeners, for making that possible. If you haven't liked and subscribed to the podcast, uh, we would love for you to do so. Drop us a review also. But we will look forward to seeing you again next week. Uh, same bat channel, same bat time, Wednesday at one o'clock Eastern time with another exciting episode. But until then, I'm Jason Cochran signing off and reminding you, don't let the shift hit your plans. We'll catch you next time. <laughs> <laughs>